Um, no, I mean, we had our board of directors meeting today and I'm sure you all saw that they're gonna start doing phase one of uh, conditioning and stuff for high school on June 15th. So that was the decision of the NMAA board today. Um, of course, it comes with guidelines and there's a lot going on, it seems like. Um, there's going to be a lot of cross country runners because mostly everything they could do at this point is run. So, um, you know, we'll keep you all posted as far as that goes. I think it's a, a positive sign that people are, are uh, getting out there at least. I know it's not in the capacity that some folks are wanting at this point, but um, it, it's a step in the right direction, I think. So our office is still closed. We're going to be closed until June 15th. So I'll, I'll continue to work from home and you all know how to get a hold of me should you need anything. But, um, you know, we're, we're plugging along. So I agree with Hector. These Thursday night webinars have been awesome. And as I was telling some of you a couple of weeks ago, the benefits of having these and, and if there is a silver lining for the pandemic for me, it's been that I've actually been able to spend time with my spring sports officials, which is a little bit different because uh, I'm usually doing music events. So I really enjoy getting to just laugh and see all and, and hang out. So that's been good. And uh, for our guest speaker tonight, I want to say thank you to you for uh, spending your Thursday evening with us. And we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. And uh, we've got a lot of folks eager to, to continue to work on their crafts, even though baseball's at a standstill right now. So everybody's, everybody's ready. They're just waiting for names. So thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, of course. So guys, last thing. Uh, so Monday, Monday evening at 7. If anything has changed, Dana, please let me know. But uh, uh, Monday at seven o'clock, we'll continue our uh, rules. Okay, uh, Monday night we will be covering um, interference and obstruction. Okay, you guys reached out after our last rules, and you guys were wanted to, uh, you know, cover interference and obstruction. So that's Monday night at seven. So Dana be will send out. It'll be at 7.30, Hector. We've got oh, wrestling yeah. at, yeah, we've got wrestling at 6, so we'll do okay. baseball at 7.30. 7.30, guys. So we'll email, we'll go out on that. Yep. And um, I don't want to take any more of his time. Um, you know, great friend of uh, us here in New Mexico. Uh, I know he's been a, you know, a, a great resource for me uh, as I have kind of moved up. Um, uh, you know, he, he has presented at uh, different uh you know, college camp that I attended. Um, he's uh, himself, he, he's a past uh, national umpire coordinator for Division II. Uh, he has umpire Division One himself. Uh, I believe he did high school too, Dan, if I, but I'm correctly, but he was uh, inducted into Colorado Dugout Club Hall of Fame in 20, uh, 2018. Uh, and the Dugout Club is like the Coaches Association. Uh, so that's another honor for him. Um, he, I know he's worked the uh, Connie Mac World Series up in Farmington many years. Um, and every, I think the last six weeks, you guys have heard about, you know, it's not so much about balls and strikes and outs and safe is how we handle coaches and situations on the field. And he's going to present to us a topic tonight, um, that we can put in our toolbox. And I'm, I'm, I'm so excited that, that he's here with us tonight. Uh, so I would like to introduce you to Mr. Dan Weichel. Dan, thanks for uh, having us. And uh, if you want to start kind of uh, telling us a little bit about yourself, and then I'll get the presentation going. Okay. It's uh, good to see all of you. I see some, uh, some names that I've uh, come in contact with uh, as an umpire on Facebook. Uh, I, enter, I invited a couple of the Denver guys to to jump on tonight. So you'll see Kenny Aducci down there in the bottom left corner. He's uh, he's one of my old uh, ninth and 10th graders when I was teaching school. I, I'm a 30 year retired teacher from Jefferson County. I was an English teacher. And uh, I did my first uh, high school baseball game in 1975. So I'm in uh, year 45. Uh, I worked my first uh, college game in 1978 simply because a lot of the older guys were retiring we had a massive retirement about uh, 1977 and 78 and they needed to they needed people who were available and I just answered the telephone basically I one of my speeches that I give to new umpires is to be that easy phone call if they need somebody 
and you can drop everything and get away with it as a school teacher it was easy for me but uh, just being available and making sure that once you get on the field that you represent yourself and your your signer well uh, they come back year after year one of the things that we really look at for our umpires is uh, when I worked in the big the big uh, the big 12 Bob Jones was my coordinator and he said we hire good people first and umpires second so what we're looking for really and I think uh, even today more than ever is we're looking for good people because you can't get away with uh, the way it was in 78 if a coach came out and uh, argued with you you basically gave back as good as you took and you stood your ground and uh, sometimes the conversations got a little bit heated and it really wasn't something that you'd really want to put on display, especially at the high school level. And, and now the NCAA has uh, also taken up that, uh, that responsibility, making sure that uh, umpires and coaches uh, get on a better, get on better terms with each other. I know when I had the position, uh, we tracked uh, ejections, read ejection reports, uh, we were trying to get everybody basically to give a warning, and that was a hard thing to do. Thirteen words. Coach, this is your warning. If you continue to argue, uh, you will be ejected. Just to get somebody to say 13 words like that in the heat of battle is very hard to get out of your mouth. So we had to work real hard just making sure that we could do that. The first time I warned a coach, I had to put my – I had to look at the ground so I didn't forget what I was supposed to say. So I know, I know it's not an easy thing. And uh, now we we pretty much universally gotten that, uh, you know, coach. If you continue to argue with high school, you'll be you'll be restricted. And generally speaking, that gives coaches a chance to clean up their act because they know what's coming after you give that warning. What I want to talk about tonight is verbal judo, and that's what happens when the coach comes out and you're you're caught in a conversation with the coach. One of the things that I've always told our umpires is you don't want to get into a conversation you don't want to have. And coaches kind of like to lead umpires off on tangents. Uh, they're very good lawyers and, and very good argue, and argumentation, much better than we are. So basically, we need kind of a prepared script. And they came up with this verbal judo years ago. George M. Thompson, he was a policeman. And they used this... Uh, with uh, law enforcement. It's how to get voluntary cooperation from people who don't want to give it. And basically how to talk to people. And uh, I'm not an expert in this by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Sergeant Ray Leibel, who was a, a, a NCAA umpire now, he's uh, with the Midland Police Force down in Texas. And he taught verbal judo to the law enforcement people down there. And then he also altered it a little bit to uh, to handle uh, what happens on the field. So this basically is, is Ray Libel talking. I've heard Ray do it like three or four different times. So uh, I'll go through it with you, let you know uh, how it works. And uh, again, as we get into it, you will see that this is a, this is a, pretty, uh, a pretty precise step-by-step -step how to talk to coaches. And once you have once you have this in your toolbox, uh, you can keep you can keep the coach on on task as he's as he's talking. You can keep control of your responses. And again, it's not a reaction; it's a response. That's a very important distinction in verbal judo. We know how we're going to respond to these coaches. When you react, you're not doing it with any forethought. But when you respond, okay, you uh, you have a plan in mind. And that's the best part of verbal judo is it gives us a plan. And again, if you want to use it, fine. If you don't want to use it and uh, what you do works fine, uh, that's also well and good. This is just uh, just another another little something to look at. And if you see the picture here with Casey Stengel, uh, I put this on the put this on the the PowerPoint because you see that umpire is listening to the coach. You know that's kind of the first rule of this verbal judo. Uh, George Thompson developed it from uh, the Bushido tradition of the samurai warrior. Uh, he, was a, he was a martial arts black belt as well as a police officer and a college professor later on. And this is all about saving face. And you have to understand when that coach comes out, he wants to be heard. And basically, it's his field. 
And if any of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Seuss book, Yertle the Turtle, coaches are a lot like Yertle the Turtle. They're, they're uh, you know, they, they're the king of all they survey and you're in their kingdom. And when they come out and they want to say something, you have to, uh, you have to save face. You have to treat them with respect. And in so doing, that doesn't mean you let them walk all over you, but it does mean that you need to be able to control the situation. Step one, you listen, even if they talk like Casey Stengel, because he's hard to understand if you've ever listened to him. Uh, this is the book that you can get online. I believe it's still, uh, it's still available, I believe, uh, through Amazon. And uh, it's learn what never to say, engage people with empathy, uh, listen better, be a better, and hear, hear what they're saying and then how to stop a verbal attack. It's, uh, it, it protects you. And it also protects the coach because once the coach comes out and he gets fired up, uh, he's looking for a way off the stage. You know, he vaudeville in vaudeville they said you had to have a really good entry, and your act could be pretty commonplace. But if you had a good entry and a and an average act, and you knew how to get off the stage without that big hook coming out to get you and pulling you off, you you could probably survive. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're going to help the coaches get off the stage providing an escort service, if you will. So that's, uh, that's verbal judo. It's a good book to read. It's been around a long time. Uh, one of the things that we talked about in our, in our clinics is to understand what type of uh, argument you're getting into. Uh, sometimes it's legitimate. A coach comes out because he actually has a question. And sometimes when they say, hey, where was that pitch? They really want to know where that pitch was. That's a legitimate question. And sometimes if something happens on the field, that you know that there's some question in the coach's mind, you have a legitimate argument. That changes the interpersonal relationship because he's not coming out to intimidate you. He's not coming out in the, in the old days, they'd come and say, uh, you never work for me again if you make that call. Right or wrong, that's what they would say. And that, that's a use of intimidation. They wanted everything called their way if you are at their field. You don't see that very much anymore. Also this personal, Something that gets personal as a result of maybe seeing a coach too many times in a row or something that uh, you just, you don't like each other for whatever the reason is. And now you're talking about things that have nothing to do with the, the baseball game and you're, you've gone off on a tangent. Now you're hurling insults back and forth at each other. And this is probably the worst type of argument you can get into. And then the last one is situational, which is, when you realize that a coach had to come out, okay, he knows that his player was wrong, right? He knows that you were right. Guy throws his helmet in disgust and he, and he gets ejected. The coach has got to come out to protect, his, to protect his player so his player doesn't go off the deep end and cause more problems. And then you have to understand that uh, that situation, when he comes out, there are people in the stands like moms and dads watching him and how he handles things. And then you got uh, – you got the kids in the dugout. You got the ones that like you and the ones that hate you. And they're all watching you. And like uh, Billy Martin said, you, you keep the five players who hate you away from the five players who are undecided. And you'll have a pretty good career as a manager. It's, it's kind of the same thing. Coaches come out for uh, what the situation dictates. Just because they're yelling at you or having an argument with you doesn't mean you were wrong. They may be putting on a show. And once you distinguish that, it kind of uh, changes the way the – the give and take goes back and forth, but it's important to know why a coach comes out. Now, the way to look at this, some people have said, well, when you use verbal judo, you let the coach walk all over you. And when we get into what the steps are, you'll see where that's a, that, that really is a very understandable conclusion, although it's wrong, because we should always look at uh, conflict as a way to test us in our creativity, because handling situations like Hector said, that's what separates the people at the top. Most of us can do balls and strikes, safes and outs pretty well, but your creative handling of coaches will get you a long way. Maintaining emotional control during disagreements. If you watch the guys in the big leagues now, you very rarely see their faces screwed up in knots. You very rarely see him yelling at the coach. You see that they're most of the time they're very calm and they're cool and they're under control. And that's, that's basically what we want 
at the high school and the NCAA level. We don't want you to escalate, the umpire to escalate the situation by not controlling his facials. And then uncertainty, confusion, anger, mistrust, these are all the things that go into these types of uh, confrontations with coaches. Sometimes they don't know the rules or they're not sure that you know the rules. Sometimes they're confused because maybe that rule has never been applied to them before in a situation. So they, they you know, coaches don't know what's in the rule book. They know what, what rules have been used when they've uh, and been enforced on the field. And that's basically how they learn. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when you got three calls to go against you, you start getting a little bit angry in the heat of battle. That happens. You have to understand that there's going to be some anger. And then there are times when anger can be misinterpreted. Uh, if you're passionate about what you're doing, we have a coach in the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference that I dearly love. His name is Stan Sanchez, and he is passionate about what he does. He's been a highly successful. Chris Hanks is another one, the same way. And to the uninitiated, you think that they're coming out and they're just full of anger, but it isn't. It's passion for the game. And once you understand that, it kind of uh, puts that anger in a, in a different uh in a different little box and you can handle that a lot more. Sometimes uh, spectators will wonder how, co how umpires can handle the angry coaches. Well, sometimes it's angry anger and sometimes it's just passion. And then it's trust. That's on the umpire. That's on the umpire. If you do things out there that you can't back up with, uh, with rules, they're not going to trust you. Uh, so these are the things that verbal judo works on. And what we're trying to do is create an environment. Okay, we want to be a contact professional. And by that, that means we can handle interpersonal relationships. If you see this picture here, that's how Hall of Fame umpire Al Barlick. And that's uh, Johnny Bench and Sparky Anderson, two on one. But if you look at Barlick, he's very controlled, right? Johnny Bench is getting a little bit crazy there. And Sparky's probably right in his face, you know. And again, there's that passion. But how do you react instead of uh, how do you how you respond instead of reacting what is your plan when a coach comes out and then what do you say how to speak sometimes we get tongue-tied sometimes we get vapor locked uh you know i'm an english teacher italian so that's never really been my problem i probably need to shut my mouth more than i than i run my mouth and i know that but uh by doing these things, you develop credibility, and, and that's a power. The coaches know, okay, I can talk to this guy. We talk about approachability. Here's where approachability lies. They believe you. They've seen you work. You have great credibility with the coach. Now, Ruben Candelaria is a guy in California that I've worked with, and he had the Candelaria rule. What you say can and will be used against you. So you have to watch what you say. Uh, listening more than talking. Uh, the only way you can really have an argument is if you have disagreement. So you try to find common ground, but again, staying calm, not being upset. Okay. Forget about victory who won and lost. Your job as an umpire is to extinguish that fire, not ignite that fire. So you have to, you have to understand that, your job is to maybe take a little crap with dignity and style. This is called being approachability. A coach knows he can come out and talk to you, and you're not going to – first thing you're going to tell him is, hey, coach, if you keep this up, you're going to get ejected. They don't want to hear that. They want to be heard. So that's, that's really what you want to do when the coach comes out. Forget about winners and losers. You learn how to talk, saving face. That means you stay professional, and the coach stays professional. Nobody loses their temper. Nobody gets embarrassed. This whole idea about I'm going to hit that coach. I'm going to zing him with a one liner. And, you know, you, you tell you, you know, you hear umpires all the time back and forth. Oh, I said this to him and I said that to him. And that's the way I was raised in the early seven, the late seventies, you know, the, they all had their war stories and you think that, man, that's the way you're supposed to handle things. Well, that doesn't handle anything. Disrespecting a coach and, you know, those, if it feels good, it's no good is the, the bottom line to these types of little zingers. You don't, you don't need to use those things. And again, the most dangerous weapon is a cocked tongue. That's what I'm talking about. 
you're, you're looking at a chance to just get it, fire off that one liner, you know, and uh, you think that that's going to really get you somewhere with the coach. And all it does is uh, it basically creates an enemy. And that's certainly not what we want. So take crap with dignity and style. Realize you have to take a little bit of crap. That doesn't mean you let them walk all over you. But you have to understand in the heat of battle, things get said that, uh, you know, sometimes they're not, they don't really mean. And now in chapter six in the book, things, things to say, right? And things not to say, right? And those are the big ones right there, right? That is not what you tell somebody when they come out to argue. Those are not the answers that you want to use. You want to let the coach talk. And you see the picture with Billy Martin. It looks like uh, – Looks like those umpires in their old red FINA gas station attendant jackets, they're, they're pretty calm. You know, they know what to expect, and I think they know how to handle Billy Martin after they've been around him for a couple of years. But th this is the mark of a professional right here, under control. Okay. Now, here's the thing about that I just talked about. This is Ray Libel. If it feels good, it's no good. Those one, those little one-liners, those zingers, you think, well, I'm glad I got them. Boy, I really said that to him, and, man, I really made my point, and I made him look bad. And, yeah, you made him look bad in front of his players, his, uh, his parents, and in so doing, you made yourself look like an idiot. So if it feels good, really, it's no good. And what do you do here when a coach comes out? Well, we talk about the sort of insertion. What do you say to a coach to get him to calm down? Because believe me, when they come out on the stage, they're fired up. That's that great vaudeville entry, you know, and you need to know how to handle that. And what they wanted, what they want most of all is to be heard. So step two is when the coach says something to you, listen and reflect it back to him. That's what paraphrasing is. Put it in your words so you have an agreement. And once you do that, You'd be surprised how much a coach will calm down because he really believes that he's being heard. The best, the best advice I ever got on a baseball field is a coach came out and here he comes from the third base dugout and I'm working first base and I know he's coming hard and man, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he comes up to me and he says, just shut up and listen. And that was the best advice I've ever been given by a coach. Just shut up and listen. But here, step two is you paraphrase. Coach wants to be heard by paraphrasing. You are confirming that you heard what he said. And now, when they won't shut up, calm down, or let you talk, you have to know how to stop them. And I think that might be on the next, uh, the next slide. That's part of the sort of insertion. So there are some, instead of, hey, shut up, right, or that's enough, or something that uh, – you use that indicates that you have some sort of uh, professional and situational power over that coach. That's the absolute wrong thing to say because the coach has the power. We know that. Co that you're, in a, you're in the coach's kingdom there. You're dealing with Earl the turtle. He's the king and he's on display. So, you know, the worst thing you could do to a coach is put your hands up and try to shut him up when he first comes on the field. Let him come and let him talk. But now when you want him to stop, here's some things to say. Whoa, whoa, just a minute now. Let me make sure I got this right. Stick in a paraphrase, right? Or listen, coach, this is what I heard. Stick in a paraphrase. Or wait, wait a second. Let me make sure I got this right. Stick in a paraphrase. All right? And again, these types of words, these three, these three examples here, these are the words that extinguish. If you use it in, in combination with some reflective listening. Let the coach know that he's been heard. They want to be heard. And you see, here's another picture of a coach who's got his hat off and he's waving it around. You know, and a lot of times coaches come out like this because they've had other encounters where they felt they haven't been heard. So if you're the type of umpire that listens to the coach, pretty soon you get the reputation that you're approachable and you can be trusted. I can go up and talk to him and I can be, you know, and I know that he's not going to throw me out of the game. Okay, that's the bottom line. We want to keep coaches in the game. We want to keep the ejections down. I know Dan 
high school level in New Mexico, just like Bert Borgman in uh, Colorado. We want to keep the ejections down. We want to keep the restrictions down. We don't want these encounters between umpires and coaches to reflect poorly on, on the game and also the institution. Remember, this is a high school, a university. You know, uh, they have a reputation they want to maintain as well. So these are things that, uh, again, whoa, listen, wait a second, combined with the reflective uh, paraf paraphrasing comment, works wonders. But again, you have to use it. And this is, this is again, Ray Libel. If it feels good, it's no good. For those of you guys who uh, third strike, you pull the chain, this is Shag Crawford. This is the guy that invented that fancy call third strike pulling the chain. It's Jerry Crawford's dad. Jerry retired maybe five years ago and uh, a couple of his sons, a couple of his brothers were in the NBA, I believe. But this is Shag Crawford. This is the guy that I watched on the game of the week and Joe Garagiola said nothing but great things about him. And I started thinking that, you know, maybe being an umpire is kind of a cool thing. But again, if it feels good, it's no good. And why? Because we insult. And when we insult, we lose power. We make enemies. We lose, we lose our professional face. We lower ourselves. And basically, you're using language irresponsible, uh, irresponsibly because you're, you're causing the problem. And then you cause the problem and you ignite the coach and then you eject the coach. Can you wonder why, and then you wonder why a coach uh, has a problem with some umpires. So anyway, here's the nuts and bolts of it. It's called the five-step hard style. Now, in, uh, in law enforcement, the last step they call act, arrest, control, and transport. That's when they actually get out the get out the handcuffs. They've done everything they can to try to calm the person they're dealing with down, and they just can't seem to get through to him. Uh, step five for us would be uh, would be to eject. But this is, it escalates. It escalates. We try to start start easy, but again, we do everything we possibly can do because I'm sure when Dana gets a report, if it, the umpire says, "Okay, I told him this. I told him that." I asked him to do this, I asked him to do that, I gave him a warning, and you gave that coach four or five opportunities to get himself under control and it didn't work. You now have written a, a, an ejection report that I'm sure that the High School Activities Association can support because they, they have to deal with the coaches and athletic directors. And basically when Dana makes that phone call, it's her against the AD and the, and the baseball coach. And sometimes, uh, you know, having a, a well-written ejection report where the umpire actually has given the coach the latitude and he hasn't used it that that really it's a it makes it an easier phone call I know it, it did with the NCAA as well uh, Jim Perano tells a story about how he uh, he got a call from one of the one of the ADs and the AD was reading the report and uh, it said in the report that the you know, the, the, the umpire eventually warned him, coach, if you continue to argue, you know, this is our last step. If you continue to argue, you're going to be ejected. And uh, the AD asked the coach, coach sitting right there. The AD asked the coach, did you get a warning? The coach says yes. And the AD says, well, you ejected yourself then. So, you know, that's, that's important that we give the coaches a chance to, you know, get out of that, that crazy impassioned attitude and maybe get into a, a more rational uh, mindset. So here, here's what you do. Here's how it works. The first step is an ethical appeal. Okay. The second step, set, step is set the context. The third, you can read it here. I'll tell you how it works. Ask, please. Hey, would you please get off that bucket and get into the dugout? All right. How many times do we have trouble with that? Okay. And you can't say, coach, get off that, get off that bucket, and get in the dugout. Now, now you're commanding them but just using the word please hey please would you get out please get off the bucket and get in the dugout please okay and again a lot of guys don't like to use the word please because they think that it kind of it kind of lessens their ability to control people but actually you have control by the rule book by the fact that you're an umpire and there's really no need to try to lord that over people so first step ask please would you do this the second step when you set a context you tell them why Coach, please, would you get off that bucket and get in the dugout? Now, the High School Activity Association wants everybody in the, in the dugout, 
and it's and it's dangerous. You're in a live ball area, and we could have problems. So now you've asked twice, basically, haven't you? And you probably might not get uh, total cooperation. So here comes the coach, right? And he wants to, he wants to under, he wants you to understand why he needs to sit on that bucket. Well, the third thing you do is you present the options and you go back through what you've already asked him. Coach, I asked you, please, and I told you why. Now, your best option is to get off that bucket and get in the dugout because the only options I have left is I'm going to warn you, possibly restrict you, and possibly eject you. And I don't want things to go that far. But this step is very important, presenting options, because it stops them and gets them to think about what the consequences are. You know, we have freedom of choice in America, but we do not have freedom of consequence. And it's just like dealing with when I dealt with seventh graders, okay? You have to let them know that there are serious repercussions that may be forthcoming if they don't do what's best for them. And again, presenting options is you always, you always tell the coach or the person you're dealing with, even in the school, what, uh, What's your best option, coach? Because this is all by rule I'm going to do. Okay, the rule book dictates that I take these steps. And then the last one is when you confirm, and I've never really had to go this far. When you confirm, it's like, coach, I've asked you, you know, twice, and I told you what is going to happen if you don't. Is there anything that I could say that would get you to move into the dugout? Now, I've never had to go to step four, because once you present options, now they're starting to think, man, if I get, if I get restricted, I'm going to get written up. If I get ejected, I'm going to get written up. And with all these, all these things, there's a, there's a consequence from the high school activities association. There may be a consequence from my athletic director. And if I've been in trouble before this year, I might have a paper trail that says that if I get in trouble again, things are going to really get serious. And you don't know that, but a lot of times that gets coaches thinking. Now, this is uh, Joe Urso, the little, the little coach. That man is the most powerful coach in Division II. And uh, Rich Maggio is about 6'5 and about 275 or 280. And uh, Maggio basically, even though it looks like it isn't, Maggio's out, he's outgunned here. Urso's a powerhouse. So I like this picture because, you know, they say dynamite comes in small packages. This is the case for sure. So anyway, those are the, that's how you do it. Now, the, the way you work this in is you can go right down one, two, three, four of the steps. Please, please tell them why, you know, and then confirm. Or you can use it more in a conversational setting where you don't have to do that. But as you're talking to the coach, while he's trying to get you off on a tangent, you should be thinking, okay, I've asked him, please. Now I got to tell him why. And I'm going to let him talk, but I'm going, to, I'm going to work that into the conversation. And he's probably going to talk some more. And then I know that I got to present options. And I'm going to try to work that into the conversation. Because once I've done all those things, okay, once I've done all those things, and I've given that coach three chances, and I get to the fourth chance, the fourth chance is that what can I say to get you to, to do this? The fourth step really is, Coach, this is your warning. If you continue to argue, you leave me no option but to restrict you. And I always throw, and possibly eject you. Because a lot of times the restriction, they, you tell them they're restricted and then they really start yelling. And then at that point, they go from restriction to ejected in like 20 seconds. I've only had that happen once. But this stuff really works. Okay? Again, the ethical appeal, it's all right there. Notice the please, please, please. The next step, ask and tell them why. And it's all right there as well, what I've already talked about. So we can skip through that. That's Tim Hatfield. You guys, a lot of you guys know him. The next step is uh, presenting options. Uh, Alby, this is uh, one of our wounded warriors that uh, worked with us in Denver and did our training. And he got to work at uh, Coors Field. Uh, they had a high school, uh, they called it a practice, but it was a game. But uh, this is Tony No Neck Morrow, one of our, one of our most famous graduates, I guess. But this is a, a personal appeal here, you know, tell them why, and then present the options. Presenting options is 
so important. You can miss the first two, or you can say please once and maybe miss it a second time, but you need to present the options because once again, letting a coach know what's in store for him sometimes gets him to stop and reconsider what's going on. Okay, the next one is step four. And that's me yelling at a couple coaches that were outside the dugout. My my partner's getting uh, getting yelled at at second base over a call, and these two uh, coaches are over there trying to help him out a little bit. And I'm asking him, you guys want to stay in the game? Yeah, well, you better zip it up because your coach doesn't need any help out there, right? We don't be yelling at umpires from the dugout across the field. But, uh, again, step four, practical appeal. Tell them why, present options, confirm, and then if you can't get anywhere after that, then it's probably a good time when you come in with coach. This this is this is your warning. Okay, this is your fourth chance. Now, Dana, if you get a if you get a report that says I gave the coach the coach four chances to avoid this, that's a pretty good report. Wouldn't you agree? That's a very good report. Yeah, and see, that's the thing that we have to remember as umpires is that we represent the High School Activities Association. When you're on the field, you represent Dana. And I know she's done some great things for you guys in New, Me in New Mexico. And she's, she's behind you 100%. But you don't want to put your boss in a position that they can't defend you. Because the bottom line is, and Dana, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you work for the schools. You represent the umpires, but you work for the schools. Is that correct? That would be correct. Right. So you're, so you're kind of a, a go-between. But it sure makes your job a lot easier if the, the coach has been given four chances and talked to rationally. It's a, it, like I always tell my officials, I will support and back you 110% until you give us a reason not to. So, <laughs> Absolutely. That's the, way, that's the way my boss in Mountain West, Jim, Jim Prana, was that way. Uh, I've had conversations with, uh, with Bert Borgman and Tom Robinson. Great conversations about this about the fact that, you know, the, and I used, when I was the area director and state president, I tell the umpires, do not expect Chassa to back you up because they work for the schools. They're not going to back you up. They're going to look, they're going to look for something that you did wrong because you are the responsible party. Now, that may be a kind of a, a difficult way to look at it, but I want the guys to know that don't expect Chassa to bail, bail you out if you messed up. You messed up because you, first of all, you weren't trained. Second of all, you didn't use your brain out there. And third, now you put, you put me in a bad position because I could not defend you. And that, uh, that is never a good thing. So the bottom line with verbal judo is you, 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 give your, you give your bosses something to hang their hat on. And again, here's uh, Cody Waterhouse. And you can see he, this is, he was a professional umpire for years. Coach is going crazy. Cody's face is calm, and he's loading up the gun, and he's ejecting him. So step five, that's when you arrest, control, and transport, or in our case, that's you've, you've, all of your options have been exhausted. You've talked to the coach. You've given him ample opportunity, and you have no other alternative, as you say in the warning. I have no option but to restrict you if you do not continue if you do not stop now the thing that you do at this point guys we all know once you give that warning you better turn and get out of there and the off umpire better get in there and help that coach get off the field because that coach is still mad at you and if you get out of the way and you withdraw yourself uh yeah some guys will say yeah you're, you're running away from a coach you're running away from confrontation no what you're doing is you're trying to keep the coach in the game and that in the bottom line is what your bosses want and that's what will get you that, uh, that playoff game in that state tournament, knowing that you can handle situations. And now when you're looking at working towards voluntary cooperation, okay, the talk, the ask and tell them why, very short, right? Very short conversation. Presenting options, that should take the longest because you're gonna get a lot of pushback from the coach, but you need to give them the options exactly what you are required again by rule to do in this situation. And finally, you confirm in the last one that's very short, that's when you eject, because if you have to eject, then you really better get out of there and let your, let your off uh, umpire come in and uh, as we say, rodeo clown that coach out of there. 
So what we want to do all in all here, we want to become a contact professional. You want to be the type of umpire that, that coaches can talk to. The type of umpire that, that on the surface, it looks like you're taking abuse, but underneath, you know what you're doing is controlling the situation. This is my good friend from East Cobb County. Uh, I ejected him from the Connie Mack World Series. And I turned him that way because I knew that the newspaper cameras were in the first base camera dugout. And uh, I wanted to get a good picture of him yelling at me because I thought maybe it'd be in the newspaper the next day. And there, there it is. So we kind of laughed about that last time we, uh, we uh, got together on the field. But he was, uh, he came out between innings after we had kind of put the, put the problem to bed. And uh, then he came out and he wanted to argue again. And I told him he, he shouldn't come out again. We've already discussed this. And at that point, he got ejected. And uh, I'm barking a little bit at him, but I don't think I have a vein sticking out in my neck the way he does. But again, this is the problem when you lose focus. Okay. Look at my face as, composed, as compared to what Cody Waterhouse looked like or some of the other umpires that uh, were shown. Okay, I am a little bit animated, and at this point, here's the problem. I'm yelling at him, he's yelling at me, and nobody is listening. Okay, this really isn't, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a classic umpire versus the coach picture. My dad really liked it, but uh, when, you, when you get a picture taken like that, that doesn't make you look real good when you really think about it. And this is Corey Blazer, our boy, trained in Denver, graduate of Pomona High School. Uh, worked the American League Championship Series last year. And again, thanks for your attention. And remember, sometimes the heat of the ass affects the brain. Don't let that happen to you. My grandmother had a saying in Italian about that. And the, the one that's uh, in bold, remember the rule of the farm, you can't fake the harvest. The rule of the farm here is unless you plant these seeds, they're never going to grow, and they're never going to sprout, and you're, not, you're never going to have a harvest. So you have to work with it. And for those of you that would like this uh, PowerPoint, I'm sure Hector will send it to you. I have no problem sharing anything that I've made with the umpires because my function basically is to, as Dick Runchy once said, help guys achieve the success and more success than I've had in my career. So hopefully we get past this uh, COVID-19, we'll have a good season and get back out there again. And I had a I had a nice video on this that I can't pull up, but it shows the coach uh, going crazy and the umpire asked him to please get back in the dugout. And man, he's like a little kid. He turns around and goes right back to the dugout. It was amazing. But anyway, that's where we're at. And uh, questions, I guess, at this point from anybody. Guys, so uh, if you want to type your questions up in the chat box, go ahead. Um, and then I'll go ahead and ask him to Don. Let me uh, go ahead and stop sharing so I can go back to. Uh, all right, I think we're back. Uh, okay. Uh, Drew, sorry, man. I, I shut it down. I, I can't put it back up. You have a question about it to ask Dan? Go ahead and ask it. And Dan, I just want to say what a great presentation for all all officials so the people who are on this uh, webinar who do more than baseball definitely applies to every every sport that is outstanding information I've the last time I think I saw a verbal judo presentation it's probably been 10 years and it's just always such good information I appreciate you bringing that to our umpires tonight I'm glad to do it because it's really helped me and giving me a, a fresh perspective and knowing what uh, high schools want now and what the NCAA wants and what your umpire coordinators at the, the upper levels want. You really need to learn how to, they say you need to be approachable and you need to handle situations. Well, nobody ever teaches you how to do that sort of thing. 
That's true. We don't rehearse it. We don't practice it. We go over the rules on all the rules uh, meetings we have, but we never talk about what do you say? How do you handle the coach? All and right. Couple, couple, couple questions, Dan. Uh, sure. how, how much is the tolerance affected by a coach using profanity? Uh, profanity gets you, uh, if it's if he, if he F bombs. Now, again, this is something that uh, Jim Perano brought up when he was a secretary rules editor. A coach just F bombing is not as bad as a F bomb followed by the personal pronoun you. Right. So you go either way on that. You can you can uh, as soon as the coach starts being vulgar, you can stop him right there and tell him, coach, we're not going to use that type of language out here. Now, why don't you just tell me what you want to say? You know, we don't need to talk like that. And if he continues and then then you hit him with the hit him with a warning right there. You can't talk to a guy that's going to be vulgar like that. But I'll tell you what I've done uh, as an NCAA coordinator. When I read those uh, ejection reports. And we had a couple where coaches were uh, beyond vulgar. Uh, I had to send all the ejection reports of the athletic directors of the, uh, the offending institution. The ones that were really bad, I also sent the ejection report to the president of the university to let the president know what uh, nice representation his uh, university or her university had on the baseball field last week. So, yeah, do not tolerate profanity. We cannot say it. They cannot say it. Uh, again, followed by you, immediate ejection. You don't have to put up with that. But if it's just he comes out and he's just what I call verbal punctuation, okay, you can't expect him. Co a lot of coaches to come out uh, calmly in one of these impassioned situations. But you can be, a, be an adult about it and just say, Coach, we can't talk like that out here. And if he stops, good. And if he doesn't, you warn him. Period. That's that's one of the that's one of the tools you have in your bag. You don't need to go through verbal judo when it's uh, an egregious situation like that. Uh, Dan, regarding arguing balls and strikes, are you using the same format? What's that again? The uh, same format as. Uh, uh oh, yeah, I well, you. Are you there? I'm fine. I got you. Something oh, happened to my computer. Okay. That was uh, yeah. Game. Regarding arguing balls and strikes, are you using the same format? Uh, well, you know, you use verbal judo when they come out, and now you're face to face confrontation. From the dugout, we have that. Uh, you know, ignore, right? And then uh, whatever the rest of it is, it's a five step thing that ends in ejection. But you you ignore, then you acknowledge, right? Then you warn, then you restrict, then eject. Uh, uh, yeah, that, there's a different way to handle what's coming out of the dugout. And put your hand up, you know, this is your warning. Because you're not he's not out there talking to you, so you don't have a chance to, to converse with the coach. This verbal judo is used when you have a face-to-face -face conversation with the coach. Now, once you give that coach a warning about balls and strikes, he may come out of the dugout. And now you have, a, you have a situation where, okay, I could throw him out right now, right? Because you gave him balls and strikes warning, and he came out of the dugout, and he continued to argue. You told him if he's going to argue, he's going to get restricted. Now, as an umpire, you have a chance to make a decision, all right? Am I going to just re re resort to what's easy, or am I going to try this verbal judo thing to see how it works, right? And I can tell you there are times when it's a lot easier to use verbal judo and walk that coach back over to the dugout and ask him to get back in the dugout than it is in front of everybody to restrict him and pump up yourself and you be the big guy and he, he gets embarrassed. And again, that uh, just throws gas on the fire. But again, that's something you have to decide for yourself. Uh, personally, if the coach has been, has been on me, been ragging me pretty good and he comes out and I'm going to tell him right off the bat, this is, this is your warning. If you continue to argue balls and strikes or you've already been warned, and now you're subject to being ejected. Sometimes that turns them around and sometimes it doesn't. And at that point, uh, you have to decide how bad it is. Uh, I'll tell you what the NCAA would like and what your high school activity association would like. They would like you to talk to that coach and help him get off of the stage. I've had this conversation with Bert Borgman and he has said under no uncertain terms, I think, I think I've been in Bert's office more than any official in the last 40 years. 
getting getting in trouble. And Dana, you probably talk to him, and he'll you bring up my name, and he'll probably oh yeah, Weichel, oh my God, you know, because uh, yeah, I've 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 made my share of mistakes, but Bert made, brought up a really good point. It's our job to help the coaches realize what proper behavior is, and sometimes you know we have to take them by the hand and lead them there. But that's our job as, as, as sports officials. Now, I really didn't like that when I heard it. Believe me, I thought that was really bending over backwards. But when you think about it and you think about the pressure that the people at the, the Activities Association your, and your umpire coordinators are under, well, I tell you what, it's a lot better not to have to write that report You're where you restricted or ejected a coach. And it's a lot better when that coach comes back the next day and says, or the next, uh, the next game, it says, hey, thanks for not throwing me out. I really appreciated that, right? That's, uh, that's, that's what makes you a good umpire. That's what uh, develops that credibility. Now you're approachable. They know they can trust you. Uh, Dan, question about training. Uh, I know, you know, knowing you personally, you do a lot in Colorado, but what do you think are some key uh, factors uh, in the training of young, young umpires? Well, I'll tell you the way we started our training. Uh, basically, from a very selfish standpoint, I wanted to learn how to umpire. And there wasn't any training in Colorado that I thought was going to get me there. And I, I went to Dave Yace, uh, who was the second national coordinator. He had an umpire camp in, uh, in Missouri, the Gateway Umpire Camp. And I went and I learned. I got out of this little fishbowl at Colorado. And I got in front and had some instructors who were ex-professionals. and boy. I realized I didn't know anything and I've been 12 years in and I felt like I was starting over again. And I thought, boy, if I feel this way, we need to bring this back to Colorado to help everybody. But the most important thing that you teach new umpires, and this is, this is hard for kids. It has nothing to do with balls of strikes, safes and outs. You are now in a position of authority. Now it's very tough for a 15, 16 year old kid to be in a position of authority and tell an adult what to do because adults do not like to be told what to do. It's very uncomfortable for these kids. So I start off with talking about the responsibility of having to control a game. And if you don't want to get yelled at, then try to eliminate your mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. That's part of the game. You have to understand that these mistakes are going to happen. Nobody is going to hate you for it. But you need to understand a little bit of this verbal judo and how to talk to a coach and tell the coach what you saw. You might be wrong, and the coach is going to disagree, but you got to be honest with the coach and let the coach talk. And then somehow, you know, we talk about how to get a coach off the field. Please, coach, we've already talked enough, and, you know, we've, we both, uh, we've agreed to disagree, basically, so let's get the game going. Right, something, something like that. But the hardest thing for young guys is, first of all, they're in a position where they matter. This job is important. If the umpire's bad or the umpire doesn't show up, now you got two teams and you got coaches who've been working all, all week and you got spectators in the stands and you've let everybody down. It's, it's a very, very important job. And these kids uh, at a very young age to be put in a position of such importance is uh, – is, is it's pretty tall order and that's really what you start with you try to you try to get their their mental get them prepared for what they're going to meet once they get out there and then of course the training is the type of training we all do you know balls of strikes safes and outs positioning let's make sure we learn this stuff because you're going to get instant feedback that's for sure uh let's see dan uh when evaluating umpires what are things that indicate to you that an umpire is a contact professional and proficient in de-escalating situations? Also, what are the indicators to you uh, that show an umpire needs to improve in this area? Well, one of the things that we look for, and again, when I, uh, when I was hired by the NCAA, they wanted uh, an evaluation system put into place. And we use the same evaluation system uh, Basically, with the NCAA, is the same one we had with our Mile High Advanced Umpire Clinic. And uh, one of the things we talked about and we had in our rubrics, because once you write it down, uh, anybody can go and evaluate an umpire if they're trained in what to look for. So if you want to see an umpire that is a good contact professional, 
you see him immediately handle something out of the dugout. Okay. And if the coach comes out, you don't see this antagonistic attitude back and forth. You see a calm discussion. I mean, they told us all the time, take your lineup card out right now, like you're talking about the lineup, but you're actually talking about something else. I've always found it's a lot easier side by side than face to face when you're talking to a coach, because that's uh, that gets a little bit uh, crazy sometimes. But one of the things I look at is, okay, how do you handle that coach when he comes out? How do you handle that kid? Right. If you call somebody out like a steal at second base and the kid's complaining about it, uh, when he gets in your face, how do you handle him? Do you tell him what you have? Do you have yourself under control? And does the kid leave the field voluntarily? Does the coach leave the conversation or the argument with the umpire? Does he leave voluntarily? Doesn't turn around and shoot one back at you over his shoulder. Doesn't snipe you. He felt like he's been heard. And uh, what he got maybe wasn't satisfactory, but he felt like he was maybe he was dealt with in a fair manner. That's one of the things you look for. How, how do you how do you end the the confrontation? Right. Sometimes it might get heated in the middle, but then can you calm it down, and can you part without you know that uh, coach yelling at something? And that's when they get ejected. We all know that the coach will yell something over his shoulder once again. Doesn't know how to get off that vaudeville stage. Yells something back over his shoulder and he ends up getting ejected or gets in the dugout and yells at you and gets ejected. Right. That's, that's really unfortunate. And a lot of times an umpire can't control that, but what we look for basically is what I talked about. How do you handle yourself as far as not looking like you're, you're trying to bite the guy's head off. You know, you don't want the vein in your neck sticking out. Uh, Dan, another question as, as a, a rookie, a rookie on the crew or a new umpire, how do you address a veteran umpire, um, you know, either on a, on a rule that uh, a misinterpretation or a rule or just, uh, you know, in a post game, um, some guys are scared to, you know, of course, tell their, you know, their yeah. supervisor or, you know, their, their uh, you know, veteran crewmate that something was wrong. How do you, how would you handle that? Yeah, I've been there. I've been the I've been the third guy on a three man crew with two guys who are ex triple A umpires and little fat Italian sitting in the corner. Uh, you know what guys like to do, the good umpires, they like to teach and they like to they like to give their opinion. So it would be like, what did you think about this situation? Or what is your opinion about this? How would you handle something like that? Instead of making it uh well, I did this and I thought I was right. And then they tell you that you weren't right. And now the con now here you go with uh, the argument that you don't want to have. Uh, you take what they give you and you thank them for taking the time to work with you. What I found is in my, in my tenure, when I used to get ripped pretty good, the reason I got ripped good is they wanted to make me better. They weren't trying to, they weren't trying to do anything for themselves. They wanted me to fit in with the crew. And if I was doing something out there that uh, that was not in keeping with the way they wanted things done, especially your crew chief, you know, you sit and listen, and then you thank that crew chief for taking the time, because if he didn't care about you, if you were a lost cause, they'd ignore you. But if they care about you, they're going to sit and they're going to work with you. And that, you know, again, you have to understand that that what that means it doesn't mean you're in trouble when they want to talk to you about things like that. They want to sit you down. It means they care about you. They want, they, they want to invest time in your success. And again, this is kind of a, you know, part of this rational emotive therapy that uh, Harlan Ellison writes about that we sometimes get irrational in these situations. But if you look at it from a rational standpoint, you are not going to invest time in somebody that you don't think is going to get there. So again, when you ask them, what do you think? What's your opinion? What, what could I have done better? You're not arguing. You're asking these guys because they have knowledge that you want. And if you look like you are soaking it up, you're going to get more than you asked for. And somewhere in there, you're going to get a couple nuggets that are, that are going to serve you well your whole career. Believe me, stuff I was told early on, I still use from the guys that were like, you know, the crew chief. I was more afraid of my crew chiefs in, uh, in Division One baseball than I was of any of the coaches. I didn't care what the coaches thought. I cared what my crew chief thought. 
that's who I wanted to prove to please. You know, you only please two people out there, you and your crew, because you work for the conference, you work for your coordinator, you don't work for the coach. And that's the thing. I think that sometimes that's where umpires go wrong, is they they think too much about pleasing the coach, and not enough about doing what's right for the game, and pleasing their crew chief if there's a crew chief out there, or pleasing their uh, their high school activities association commissioner, because these are the people ultimately that. Uh, it either defend you or, you know, send you on your way. And again, like I said, I was in trouble a lot with Bert and Tom, but I always felt like they had my best interests at heart, that they were trying to help me out. So even though we had, we had uh, several conversations, I, I welcomed the conversation because I knew I was going to learn something. And, you know, Tom Robinson was an ex uh, division one football official and he's a wealth of knowledge. And just sitting and talking to people like that that have been places that I haven't or that you haven't, you're going to pick up some stuff that you might not ever get on the field because you don't have the benefit of their experience. Awesome. I think a couple more. That you're okay, uh, Dan? Oh, yeah. Uh, Let's go. I'm what, good. Have, what have you found to be the best way to convince a coach he is not going to get a second opinion from another umpire on a judgment call? Well, you know, uh, we talk about this in the NCAA. Our, our uh, director of uh, umpiring, Tom Heiler, uh, you know, we used to talk about if an umpire is 110% of his, 110% sure that his call was correct, that he doesn't have to go get a second opinion. Uh, Heiler has kind of come back from that a little bit and saying, you know what, if the coach wants a second opinion, let him go get a second opinion. And after he gets a second opinion, he better leave and not argue that both of us are uh, – that both of those umpires are horrible. He can have that second opinion if he wants it. And in our NCAA book, it says that whenever an umpire is not uh, sure of his call, he can bring the crew together for a conference. You know, so the bottom line is to get it right. But, again, if you're 110% sure that you got it right, I I've told coaches that. I've told coaches, I'm 110% sure I got it right. And then he said, and the coach says, and you just give it, be an arrogant SOB. Well, I've known this kid, this coach, since he was like 15 years old. So I just told him if I didn't like his dad so much, I'd throw him out. But I had, you know, I had to kind of water under the bridge with this kid. But uh, there are, there are times when, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt if the coach is respectful and you can trust him. Again, that whole idea about trust goes two ways that we talked about with verbal judo. If you trust the coach, okay, yeah, okay, let's go get a second opinion, right? And if, if you don't trust the coach and you know what he's going after, what's that, where, what, what is that going to lead to? Uh, yeah, you just tell him, no, we're not going to get a second opinion. What I, I, I'm 110% sure, and by rule, I do not have to get a second opinion. That's in the high school rule book. You do not have to get a second opinion. Again, you can uh, back yourself up with the rule. You can hide behind the rule. But understand that that requires that once you say by rule, coach, you better know that the rule that you're stating is correct. Thank you, Dan. And uh, we always and oh, we just let's see, uh, we just got another question. Have you ever worked with a fellow umpire that brings danger to you? Um, fit all the negativeness you addressed tonight, and how did you deal with it? Well. We've, uh, in high school, I always felt like, you know, uh, with our training, we could identify those people early on and maybe steer them away from working high school sports, let them go work a uh, little league, uh, on the field, on the field. I, I, I will not confront another umpire over something they've done wrong. After the game, yes, I will. And I'll tell them that this is what I expect from you. And guess what? We're going to work again two more times this week, and I better see a change. Because as a senior umpire, and again, if you are a senior umpire, you are responsible for the quality that goes out on the field. And you should not tolerate those people that don't give you the type of quality that you bring to the game, right? We're trying to make other umpires kind of in our image. If you're a lead umpire, it's your responsibility for quality control. 
Now, just telling a guy how bad he is, that doesn't make it. Telling a guy how bad he is and going out and showing him and working with him to make him better, now that's, the, that's, really, where the, that's really where the rubber meets the road. You have to be part of the solution. So it's easy to badmouth a fellow umpire. But you know what? We are all in this together, right? We wear the same uniform. We get the same rate of pay. When you go out as a crew, you actually won because they never say, well, that one umpire is really good and that other umpire sucked. What they say, those umpires sucked, right? The bad guy is going to bring the, the, the good guy down. So as a good guy, it's your job to help the bad guy become better. Now, if you get a guy that doesn't want to listen and you can't work with him, then again, and I'm, I'm kind of cold hearted about this, but I've done it in the past. It's your job to drive him out. Because I've asked guys, how much are you making for this game? And they tell me, it's the same thing I'm making. But my shoes are shine, my pants are clean and pressed, my shirt is clean, I've cut my hair, I don't have a beard, and we're making the same amount of money. So you explain to me what the deal is with you. You know, and they start in about, well, they don't have enough money to afford this, that, and the other thing. Okay, here's what you need to do. I've even polished a guy's shoes for him, show him how it's done. Because sometimes, you know, you never know. You never know. I, I was raised by a lieutenant colonel. Right? I, I know how to wear a uniform. I know how to spit polish uh, shoes. I know how to stand and deliver because I was forced to do that as a kid. But there are a lot of people out there that might not have the benefit of our background. And again, instead of uh, immediately writing them off, it's really our job. And I've made, I've made this speech before. It's our job to help everybody get better. That's kind of what I've always felt my job was as an umpire. Not that, uh, that I wanted a big reputation, yada, 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 yada. I didn't want that. I wanted everybody to be better. I wanted umpiring to be good because it's a really a beautiful game. But if the umpiring is bad, it just somehow the beauty just drains away. All right. And then we always, we always end with this question, Dan. Um, when you think of your favorite, most important game you have ever done, which one comes to mind first and why? Well, actually, I, there's a couple of them. My first game in the Jefferson County Junior Baseball League, because I, I realized that, uh, you know, working for $9 a game, we worked four, four games a day, made $36, but I, I discovered that I really liked it. So, you know, that, that first game, because it went so well, but, and again, this is, this is not to brag, but this is part of a, a story that I tell umpires about being prepared when that phone call comes. Because you never know if it's going to come. But if you're not prepared for it, when it comes, uh, you're not, you might not be able to answer the phone. Uh, years ago, we had, and, and this, is, this is a true story, 1984 Olympic team came to town, came to Denver. Mark McGuire, Barry Larkin. Odomi McDowell, Will Clark. They were all first round draft choices. Uh, the coach was Rod Dado from uh, Southern California. They played the Japanese All-Stars at Mile High. Well, we're all sitting around, me and some of the, some of the other guys. You know, you make great friends as umpires. And, okay, we're, we are not going to pay to go watch a ball game. So well, how are we going to get in? I mean, we're not going to jump the fence. That's stupid. But let's call up Bob Burris, the general manager of the Denver Bears at the time, who we knew. And just offer our services. Hey, Bob, we'll sweep up. We'll clean latrines, you know, whatever you need. Just let us get in. We want to watch a game, but we don't want to. We don't have to pay. And uh, the line was like dead. There was crickets. And I'm going, oh, man, we must have really made him mad. And he says, umpires, umpires, we don't have any umpires for the game. Would you guys like to umpire the game? Now, they sold 35,000 tickets. The game was on Friday. This was a Wednesday. Oh, you bet we want to umpire the game. And well, what do you what do you, you want to get paid? No, just let us in. Just let us in. We'll umpire for free. Well, we went and umpired that game in '84. And as a result, every Olympic team that came through town, we got the call. And Keith Bailey and I made sure that uh, we spread it around to all the other college umpires, so everybody had kind of a gem on their resume. But we worked in front of the. We worked in front of the largest crowd ever to see an amateur baseball game, 66,000 people. The Cubans came to town in 96. 
and they were uh, having fireworks. So of course, everybody was there to see the fireworks, but we got to work that game. And from there, I get a call from Rich Fetchett years uh, later. Uh, Dan, you got any international experience? Yeah, I do. Have you ever worked with Cubans? Yeah, I did. Well, send us your resume. We may need to send you to Taiwan. I'm going, me, I'm a nobody. You got all these other umpires. Well, we don't, we just need somebody we can rely on in case something happens, right? Okay, so once again, I don't hear from him. I don't hear from him. Finally, I get a call. We need you. I said, when? He says, two days. I said, I don't have a, I don't have a plane ticket. It's at the airport. So I got to go to Taiwan, and then I got to go to Cuba. And it all started with the phone call in 1984 because we were looking to try to get into a baseball game. But here's the, here's the bottom line. We were good enough to survive. And that led to bigger and better things for all of us. So that's, you know, what's the most important game? The game that opens the door for you, that you can look back and say, this was, the, this was what really set my career in motion. And all that, everything I got with the NCAA and, and, and from that, uh, it all came from that in 1984 phone call for the Olympic team. Awesome, Dan. Hey, well, you know, thanks again for joining us tonight. Um, you know, I, I, I listened to that presentation three or four times already at different clinics, and I, I, I love it every time. I know I, I, I use it out, out there on the field. Um, so I want to appreciate, you know, thank you. And, you know, we appreciate you, uh, you know, making our, our, our New Mexico umpire better tonight. I'm glad to do it. I like talking umpiring. I'm getting to the end of my career. So, you know, this is all an old guy like me can do is, uh, is talk a big story anymore as long as I don't have to get out on the field. <laughs> but again, yeah. guys, uh, good luck to all of you. Uh, Dana, good luck. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing for the umpires in New Mexico. I've, I've talked to Hector. I've talked to uh, Mr. Toledo. Okay. I've talked to some of the guys down there about what's going on and what you're doing for them. And I, I think it's a wonderful thing. So I thank you for them as well. Well, thank you. And I'd love to have you come down and, and visit us sometime. Uh, you're, you're not that far away from us. So I'd love to have you come down and do some training with our folks when we have our, our clinics. I'm saying when, because I'm being optimistic, but I did want to say you do a spot on Rich Fetchett impersonation. <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, that was pretty solid. But uh, thank you so much for spending your evening with us. And I, I look forward to having continued conversations with you in the future. And, and I really do appreciate you sharing your knowledge with our with our umpires because it makes all of us better. Well, well thanks very much. It's uh, you know, it's an honor to be able to do that and, and just great to have all everybody listening for once. I taught seventh grade and very few of them listen there, but uh, captive <laughs> audience is always good. So thanks very much, guys, and good luck Thank to you. Thank you. All right. Awesome, ladies, man. Thank you. Gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. Again. Right. Good night. All right, guys. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Dan. Thank good you so you. much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Always appreciated. Thanks, guys. Uh, remember Monday night, 730, uh, obstruction interference presentation. Uh, and you guys have a good uh, good weekend. Thank you. And also, thanks, Dana. Uh, thanks everybody. I'll thanks, Dana. Thanks, Hector. Email out on uh, Monday. Or no, I'll actually send it tomorrow about okay. Monday. Thanks, Dana. Thank you. Richard, Richard, see you too, guys. Bye, everybody. We'll see you, Big John. Bye, Christina. Hey, Bye, everybody. Bye, Dwayne. Question. Adios, amigos. Bye, everybody. Be safe. Be healthy. Yes, sir. God bless. Drew, you have a question? Yeah, Hector, I'm just curious if you've heard anything from any tournament guys that they're still aiming for whatever, mid-July, anything else? Well, any our, our, first, our first three tournaments here got canceled. Well, they didn't right. get canceled. They got re uh, the first one got can The first two got canceled, and then the next two got rescheduled for July. Um, so right now, our next thing that we have on the books is – January, uh, June 24th.